Good morning and welcome. I'm Jane Fielding and I'm head of the Employment, Labour and Equalities team here at Gowling in the UK. And this is the first of our series of four webinars which we're putting on over the next couple of weeks to replace our usual annual update seminar when we host you in our offices uh, and give you an update on what's coming down the tracks for the year ahead. Sadly, we really hoped we would be able to uh, host you in the offices um, this time, but unfortunately that's not the case. I'm sure like us, many of you are working from home, um, but I really hope that by June, when we do our mid-year review, uh, we will be able to host you again, but, but we'll just have to see. So for now, uh, we have these four webinars planned, and the first topic that we've chosen is insolvency, and particularly, obviously, uh, the employment law aspects of insolvency. Now, with the impact of the pandemic ongoing and likely to get worse when the various government support measures end uh, in a few months time and the reality of Brexit hitting many businesses now, now we're outside the customs union, uh, we are seeing more insolvency situations arise. And so we thought it was a timely uh, opportunity to remind people of the key employment law issues that you need to be thinking about if you are faced with an insolvency situation. So it could be that there's an opportunity for you to buy an insolvent business in your sector, uh, a business that's struggling and you see an opportunity to take over. It could be that you have to do something because one of your suppliers in your supply chain is struggling and that's going to impact on your business. So you either need to bring it back in house or retender it. Whatever the situation is and whatever the type of insolvency uh, that you're looking at, you need to understand the employment law framework uh, so that you don't end up making a difficult situation worse by triggering um, employment claims. So I'm delighted that Hannah Swindle, one of the senior lawyers in our team who's an expert in this area, is going to talk you through all the key things uh, that you need to know about employment law and insolvency. So Hannah's going to spend about 25 to 30 minutes um, talking you through that. We've left some time at the end for questions. If you do want to ask a question, then please can you type it into the Q&A function, which you'll find in the middle of the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we will do our best to pick up as many of those as we can um, in the time available. If you've got a technical problem, hopefully there won't be any, but if you do have one, please feel free to use that Q&A function for that as well. And Lucy Strong, who's helping us with the um, tech side of things today, will do her best to help you with whatever problem you've got. As I say, hopefully the tech will all work. And on that note, I will hand over to Hannah. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the webinar. As Jane mentioned, this one is aimed at in-house counsel or advisors of both um, the potential buyers of insolvent businesses and the customers of services where the supplier becomes insolvent. Um, as Jane mentioned, it's clear both scenarios are becoming more common. Um, the numbers of companies facing insolvency is definitely on the increase. There are employment law considerations and implications which are relevant for both. So this morning, um, I'm going to provide you with a practical guide to those employment law issues and potentially significant risks, together with some ways um, of mitigating them. I'm going to talk about the effect on employment contracts of the main insolvency procedures, a summary of the government employee protections, the effects of, of TUPI in an insolvency outsourcing situation, um, and including the potential risks for a buyer or a customer of services, and some ways to mitigate those risks. I'll also mention the government's coronavirus job retention scheme in the context of insolvency. Before I, before I start, um, I wanted to highlight that, of course, um, you know, employment law considerations are relevant for companies which are facing insolvency situations themselves and for insolvency practitioners. These considerations are different, um, and I'm not going to cover them in the webinar today. So the type of insolvency has a different impact on employees' contracts of employment. As we've got limited time this morning, I've concentrated on the main types of insolvency proceedings only. So the first, um, a compulsory liquidation. In a compulsory liquidation, contracts are automatically terminated on appointment of the liquidator by the court, but it's still treated as a redundancy. So the employees can still claim their statutory redundancy pay and also some of their unpaid wages, holiday and notice pay from the government's national insurance fund. 
And where there are 20 or more redundancies, employees can also bring a claim for a protective award for failure to collectively inform and consult. In a members and creditors voluntary liquidation, contracts of employment are not automatically ended because the business of the company carries on, although it's likely there's going to be redundancies shortly afterwards when the business is wound up. In an administration, contracts of employment with the company continue. The administrator is an agent of the company, so the identity of the employer hasn't changed. To terminate employment contracts, the administrators have to carry out redundancies, which they are likely to do before they've um, been appointed 14 days, because after that time, they're judged to have automatically adopted the employment contracts. And that means that certain employee liabilities or debts have super priority. Finally, CVAs or company voluntary arrangements don't immediately affect contracts of employment. The company continues here as a going concern. So where an insolvent employer owes an employee money, some can be claimed from the Secretary of State by way of the National Insurance Fund. And employees or workers can claim up to eight weeks of unpaid wages, and that's up to the maximum weekly cap, which is currently um, £538. The wages claimed can include a protective award. Employees can also claim up to six weeks accrued or taken holiday pay up to the weekly limits, statutory redundancy payments, statutory notice payments, and also a basic award from fair dismissal where they've brought a successful claim. But in the usual way, employees can't usually claim both this and statutory redundancy. They can also claim some pension contributions and unpaid benefits such as statutory maternity pay or sick pay. These amounts are important in the context of TUPE, as I'll come on to, because they don't transfer to an incoming employer under TUPE in insolvency scenarios. So moving on to TUPE now and its impact in insolvent sales and in outsourcings. I'm conscious some of our delegates won't be employment specialists. So as a quick reminder, TUPE applies to a relevant transfer. And this can be a sale of a business as a going concern, or alternatively, an outsourcing or insourcing of services where there's a transfer of activities which remain fundamentally the same, and there's a grouping of employees who have been organised deliberately to carry out activities for that particular client. So where TUPE applies, employees and workers who are assigned, or in other words, essentially dedicated to the business or service, automatically transfer to the incoming employer or transferee on their existing terms and conditions of employment. They keep their length of service and they transfer with all their existing rights and liabilities, although there are some exceptions for occupational pension schemes and criminal liabilities. Insolvency scenarios also have some further exceptions, which I'll speak about in a moment. TUP also gives transferring employees some increased protections, both around changing terms and conditions of employment and dismissal. Any changes which are by sole or principal reason of the transfer avoid. Changes which are unconnected with the transfer or for an economic, technical or organisational reason entailing changes in the workforce and where the employee agrees those changes are permitted. This is going to be relevant for any incoming employer as it means that it's harder to change terms and conditions of the transferring employees post-transfer, but there is a slight relaxation where insolvency proceedings apply, which I'll come on to. Any dismissal, which is by um, sole or principal reason of the transfer is automatically unfair for employees with more than two years service. And any unfair dismissal liabilities transfer to the incoming employer. This is very relevant for a buyer where dismissals have already been made in the insolvent seller's workforce. So, for example, they may have been made to make the business more attractive for a sale because the buyer can inherit any liabilities where successful claims are brought by the ex-employees. Dismissals which are for economic, technical or organisational reasons can be potentially fair. So, for example, this might be where there's a, a genuine redundancy situation. Under TUPE, the outgoing employer is obliged to provide employee liability information, which is a certain minimum list of, of information about the employees, including their main terms and conditions of employment, information about any claims and collective agreements, and that has to be provided no later than 28 days before the transfer. 
And finally, the, main, the other main point of GP is that outgoing and incoming employers must provide employee representatives um, who will be trade union, staff council reps or specially elected reps with certain information about the transfer and consult with them about any post-transfer changes or measures proposed by the incoming employer. If there's a failure to comply, compensation of up to 13 weeks gross pay can be awarded. So that's basically a, a quarter of the wage bill. Importantly, for a solvent buyer of an insolvent business, liabilities are joint and several between the outgoing and the incoming employers. The main obligation to carry out that information and consultation is for the outgoing employer, which usually means that they have the primary liability. But here, because the outgoing employer is insolvent, the solvent buyer could end up with all of that liability. If there are special circumstances, which mean that it's not reasonably practicable for the consultation to be carried out, there is a defence available. But the tribunals have all confirmed that this is going to be interpreted in a really limited way. It's not enough that there's an insolvency situation that doesn't get you home and dry. It doesn't necessarily mean that the tribunal would cons consider that it wasn't reasonably practicable for the parties to consult. But it might be enough um, if the insolvency situation happens very suddenly. But in any event, case law has also confirmed even then you've got to do what you can in the time available. So in an insolvency situation, there could be a relevant transfer where a buyer is buying an insolvent business or where a supplier of services is in insolvency proceedings and the customer is either going to take those services back in house or appointing a replacement. There are special rules in GP which apply and they're aimed at trying to save jobs by making failing businesses more attractive to buyers. So for the purposes of GP, insolvency proceedings are split into two types. The first type of proceedings are called non-terminal and they're dealt with under Regulation 86 of GP. And these are relevant insolvency proceedings which have been opened not with a view to the liquidation of the assets of the, the transferor. It's crystal clear what that means, isn't it? Um, government guidance suggests that this will include a number of different insolvency procedures including administration, um, and that could be an ordinary administration or a prepack, um, which is where there's an immediate sale of the business on appointment of the administrators. In non-terminal proceedings, where an insolvency practitioner has been appointed, TUP applies, but with some slight changes or relaxations. So employees will retain most of the GP protection. There's still an automatic transfer of all assigned employees, not just the ones that you might want to keep on. There is a requirement on the outgoing employer to provide employee liability information, but often an administrator who's come in is not going to have the time or the information available to be able to comply or to comply fully, even if it can do some things. And the obligations on the incoming and outgoing employer to inform and consult will also still apply. I've already mentioned that the buyer may end up with liability for information and consultation liabilities, even though the main obligation to consult belongs to the outgoing employer. Liability under GP is joint and several, so the whole award could potentially be enforced against the buyer. There's going to be a transfer of most pre-existing employee liabilities to the incoming employer, and these could be significant where the outgoing employer is insolvent. Liabilities can be made up of pre-existing salary arrears, unpaid holiday, and any ongoing claims caused by the sellers acts or emissions pre-transfer, so for example discrimination. But some outstanding liabilities, and these are mostly um, limited amounts of pay arrears, won't transfer to the incoming employer and can be claimed by the employee from the National Insurance Fund. And those are the amounts I mentioned earlier. These are the eight weeks pay, six weeks accrued holiday pay, and some pension liabilities. Those claims are taken over by the government, and so the debts remain with the outgoing employer or company in administration. Redundancy payments aren't mentioned here in the GP relaxation because there's no termination of employment where an employee automatically transfers under GP. It's also often the case that a seller or administrator will make dismissals before a sale. Um, and if the real reason was to make the business more attractive for a buyer rather than a genuine redundancy, 
connected automatically unfair dismissal liabilities are going to end up with the buyer. There may also be collective redundancies pre-transfer, which are where 20 or more dismissals are proposed of employees who would otherwise have transferred. So if the relevant obligations to consult are not complied with, then employees can also claim for a protective award and liability for this award may also transfer. I've mentioned that some flexibility is permitted in relation to changing terms and conditions of employment. Normally, 2P restricts the ability of an employer to make changes by principal reason of the transfer. But in an insolvency situation, if certain conditions are satisfied, the transferor or the transferee can agree what's called permitted variation to terms and conditions of employment of the assigned employee. But the reason for the changes has to be to safeguard employment opportunities by ensuring the survival of the business, not just to make it more attractive for sale, for example. Um, and there also has to be consent from appropriate representatives. You can't just go directly to the individual employees. So the conditions that have to be met are quite stringent. And even all of that, even if you jump through all the hoops, it's not certain that any changes will be valid until they're tested at tribunal. So I think this means um, the provisions have limited benefit, really, and I've never seen them used by a client. The effect of QP results in increased risk for a potential buyer or an incoming provider of services or the customer. So in a solvent sale, employee risk is commercially apportioned between the parties using contractual indemnities and warranties. A buyer would receive these from a seller and an incoming employer in an outsourcing situation would usually be able to benefit from indemnities given by um, the existing supplier or service provider. In this way, the incoming employer protects itself against any employees who haven't been identified as transferring unexpectedly claiming to transfer and also any pre-transfer liabilities. And it can also protect itself against the outgoing employer's failure to inform and consult, for example. But in practice, um, in an insolvent sale, a buyer is not going to get any indemnities and warranties um, and the seller wouldn't be able to pay out under them in any event. So all employees in scope will transfer with all their existing pre-transfer liabilities, save for the amounts that can be claimed from the National Insurance Fund. Deals are often fast paced in an insolvency situation. So there's less time than usual for due diligence um, or even that information may just not be available. The incoming employer could also inherit liabilities from any employees who've been dismissed by reason of the transfer. It doesn't matter if those dismissals have been made before a potential buyer has been identified. And this can be a significant issue if large scale redundancies have been made of a unionized workforce, or alternatively, um, if a buyer only wants to take on some of the seller's employees and leave the rest behind, who will then be made redundant by the administrator. There's risk attached to any who are dismissed. An incoming employer would also usually obtain an indemnity to cover any liabilities resulting from a failure of the outgoing employer to inform and consult. This is a real problem in an insolvency situation because there's often not enough time to do this process properly. Um, and a claim is a real possibility, although it's fair to say it's more likely in a unionized workforce. In an insolvency situation where a solvent buyer is purchasing a business from an administrator, buyer risk is also increased because they're often asked to cover increased liabilities under the sale agreement. Um, this is something to look out for. An administrator often wants the buyer to take on all employee risks and liabilities, not just in relation to those that are transferring. They want a clean slate going forward because this helps their creditors. And they often also want the buyer to underwrite those national insurance fund liabilities, those amounts the employees are owed by their insolvent employer, which they can claim from the government. Those liabilities don't transfer to the buyer under QP, as I've mentioned. And when the government pays out money to the employee, it takes over the employee's claim in the administration. So the administrator often asks the buyer to take on this liability under the agreement so that they don't have any outstanding claims. The buyer should try and limit the contractual protections it gives as far as possible, although I recognise that the ability to push back um, usually depends on commercial bargaining position. <clears throat> 
So how should a buyer proceed? As the first step, make sure that you're clear what insolvency procedure is being used. This is really important because it affects what happens to the employee's contracts of employment, as we've seen, and it also affects the impact of TUPI. If a terminal insolvency proceeding is being used, which I'll come, to, come on to next, the position for a buyer is very different. But if we assume that the procedure used is administration and there will be an automatic transfer of employees, what can you do to mitigate the potential risk? So first of all, try and do as much due diligence as possible. So this way, the size of the likely risk can be determined. You can see if the deal is worth it. The administrators do have an incentive to help. They want to try to get a sale to help their creditors. And you may also have a friendly contact in the business if you've been in pre-insolvency discussions with the company. The type of workforce is relevant here. If there are unions or if the job situation is poor in a particular area, claims may be more likely. So once you've reviewed that risk and the likely risk, you can't deal with that in the usual way through indemnities, most likely. So other ways to manage risk is by reducing the purchase price, or it might be possible to agree a price retention or escrow account for a set period in order to cover the risk of potential claims after completion. And if those claims don't materialise, the seller keeps the money. To help with any possible dismissal claims, you could ask the insolvency practitioner to provide evidence that the, the employees were dismissed for a genuine redundancy reason. Then this could be used by the buyer in, in the event of a tribunal claim so that they could defend the claim more easily. Another question to ask is whether the insolvency practitioner, practitioner could arrange for any senior staff who aren't being retained to enter into three-way settlement agreements. And this way, any possible claims against both the outgoing and incoming employers can be prevented. Finally, you should ask the insolvency practitioner to cooperate with the TUPI information and consultation process. It's important to do as much as you can in the time available, however limited that is. So, for example, some of my clients where they're um, looking to buy an insolvent business have drafted a TUPI information letter um, for the IP to send out. And then that will make it more likely that a busy insolvency practitioner with lots on his plate will be able to comply. You can also reduce the requirement to consult by not making any changes to the transferring employees working conditions post transfer. In that case, the duty to consult will only be voluntary and so potential liabilities from any claim are likely to be reduced. It's fair to say that um, a buyer in a proposed purchase is often in a much better position than a customer in an outsourcing situation. The buyer can always choose to walk away if the risk is too large. But often a customer of services where the supplier is facing insolvency can't just choose to walk away because um, the services are necessary or critical for the business. The customer um, often has the choice of taking those services in-house or of appointing a replacement supplier. So the incoming employer will inherit the employees and face all of those same potential issues that I've already outlined. Where a replacement supplier is used, they're often going to expect the customer to stand behind the risk and provide the usual protections that would be passed on from the outgoing employer for pre-transfer liabilities, for example. Either way, the customer is likely to have to take on responsibility um, for potential costs and liabilities. The second type of proceedings set out in TUPI are in Regulation 87. These are terminal proceedings. They're defined as bankruptcy proceedings or any analogous insolvency proceedings instituted with a view to the liquidation of the assets under the supervision of an insolvency practitioner. So again, absolutely clear. Um, government guidance here suggests that terminal insolvencies would involve compulsory liquidations and also creditors' voluntary liquidations. Where you have terminal insolvency proceedings and a relevant transfer situation, TUPI does not apply in full. So what does that mean? Well, firstly, there's no automatic transfer of employees. This is good news for the buyer or incoming employer. They can cherry pick the staff they want and leave the rest. They can also employ them on their own terms and conditions because the, um, the protections around changing terms and conditions don't apply 
and neither do the protections, special protections around dismissal. But there are provisions in the Employment Rights Act 1996, which mean that employees taken on can still maintain continuous service. And strangely, under this regulation, even though there isn't a transfer, the information and consultation requirements still applies, um, together with the requirement to provide employee liability information. In a compulsory liquidation, it's likely that employees will have been dismissed automatically on the appointment of the liquidator on day one. So it may not be practical to talk to the employees about a lack of transfer anyway. Um, I haven't seen a successful claim for failure to inform a consult, but because these regulations still, uh, and these obligations still apply in the regulation, the theoretical risk remains. I wanted now to touch on the government's coronavirus job retention or furlough wage support scheme, which has um, now been going on rather longer than, than we first envisaged. The scheme has meant that um, the businesses have been able to furlough staff rather than make them redundant. It was originally meant to end on the 31st of October last year, but it's now been extended to the 30th of April this year. The original rules apply to the extended scheme, um, but there are a few changes. Neither the employer nor the employee need to have previously used the CJRS in order to be able to claim. And the scheme is available in respect of employees who are on the employee, employer's PAYE payroll by the 30th of October 2020. So how does furlough interact with Chupi? So if the incoming employer is inheriting employees under Chupi from a business with furloughed staff, the new employer is eligible to claim under the CJRS in respect of those transferring employees if they've transferred on or after the 1st of September 2020, where either the Chupi or PAYE business succession rules apply to the change in ownership, and they were employed by either their new or their old employer on the 30th of October 2020. And the government has specifically confirmed that this includes Chupi transfers of fellow staff from an insolvent business. The government also confirmed um, that a new employer is eligible to claim in respect of the employees associated with the transfer of a business from the liquidator of a company in compulsory liquidation. So where Chupi would have applied had the company not been in compulsory liquidation. There's been a lot of publicity about misuse of the scheme. Fortunately, where there is a transfer, Penalties or liabilities connected with that misuse don't transfer, they're going to remain with the outgoing employer. There have been two high profile cases involving administrators and furlough, um, both from near the start of the furlough scheme back in April and, and May last year. Um, the first involved the restaurant chain Carluccio's Limited um, and the second was Debenhams. Both of these cases were brought by administrators asking the court for confirmations um, for a number of points, but amongst others, whether they were permitted to furlough employees. The original um, scheme guidance said that the government expected an administrator only to access the scheme if there was a reasonable likelihood of rehiring workers. So that suggests that they would only be able to furlough staff if it was really quite likely that a sale was going to take place. These two cases involved some quite technical points, um, which were more relevant for administrators really. So I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but the overall effect of both the cases um, was that the court confirmed administrators could furlough employees where there's a reasonable likelihood of retaining workers. Um, they aren't required to do so, but the option is there. So that means that they could and maybe should uh, retain while looking for a buyer rather than making day one redundancies because they can't afford to pay wages. It allows them to mothball the business, um, which sometimes can help find a buyer because that business is then ready to go um, at the point the sale is finalized. It does come with a few downsides. Where furlough has provided extra time and a breathing space, the tribunals may be more likely to expect a GP information and consultation process to be carried out before a transfer. And that then could result in an increased award if, if there isn't the process. In the same way, if dismissals have been made, a tribunal may be less likely to agree they were made for genuine redundancy reasons rather than a transfer related reason because wages are covered under furlough. That would increase the risk of automatic unfair dismissal liabilities for the buyer. 
There may also be some unintended consequences of keeping employees on furlough. Um, a buyer of the business may inherit increased accrued holiday liability um, arising from the employees remaining in employment on um, furlough leave. As a practical point, where transferring employees are already on furlough, it would also be important for the incoming employer to look at the furlough agreement and variation of contract agreed with employees to check whether this is valid and so the terms of which they're going to inherit the staff. And finally, as a reminder, um, if the buyer does need then to make redundancies post-transfer, employers must base statutory redundancy and statutory notice pay on the employee's normal wage rather than on any reduced furlough wage. So that um, ends my webinar for today. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been useful. I've, um, I've given you a summary of the main employment implications where there's either um, a potential purchase of an insolvent business or where a customer has to deal with the insolvency of its supplier, practical ways of mitigating risk, um, and finally, an overview of the impact of Tupi and insolvency in the context of furlough. So I'll now hand back to Jane and we're going to deal with some questions. Thanks, Anna. So we have got some questions. I'm not sure if we're going to have time to answer um, all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, there's one, one request actually, which we can easily deal with, which was to have the case references for Carluccio's and Debenham. So we can um, email that to everybody who's, uh, who's dialed in after, after the webinar. So uh, that's that one dealt with. Um, so Hannah, there's one here about, um, you talked about uh, doing your best to do due diligence when you're looking at buying a business from an administrator mm -hmm. and asking for employee information. Um, the question is, what employee information might you best be asking for as a buyer? What, what are you looking for and, and what can you hope to get? Yeah, a, a lot of the questions you're going to ask, you'd be asking in a solvent sale as well. So um, you want to know the, the overall wage costs for the workforce, what terms are they employed on? If Chief applies, you're going to inherit those staff on their existing terms and conditions. Um, but also in an insolvent sale, you want to know if there's any existing wage or benefits arrears because you're going to pick up most of those under Tupi, um, apart from those limited amounts that can be claimed from the National Insurance Fund. So how much, what are we looking at here? What's the overall size of the employee cost? You also want to know if there's any um, employee tribunal claims. You don't want to pick up any problems for, for that. And also importantly, check the pension position. Um, what type of scheme is in place? I mean, this is, of course, also relevant for a solvent sale, um, but pension liabilities can be very significant if there's a final salary scheme and the insolvency itself will increase that risk and cause more problems. Here, because of that potential for inheriting automatic um, unfair dismissal liabilities, you want to know and check whether either the seller or the administrator has already made dismissals. Um, of staff. You want to know when they were made to see whether they're out of time to bring a claim and also to try and gauge the reason um, why they were made. How many are there? Um, all this goes to trying to work out what your potential risk is um, around um, potential dismissals. And then I think it's really important to remember that it's not just the seller's own employees who might be a problem. Um, you also need to look at in the context of the overall business, are there any subcontractors? Um, are there any um, sort of service providers in place, such as um, cleaners or security? You shouldn't forget about these because often if you take on a business, um, you could risk a further transfer of those connected staff um, when the buyer appoints their own service providers. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's one that's a, maybe a follow up from that, maybe separate, but um, you mentioned in your talk, and you touched on it then, unfair dismissal liabilities um, and the compensation that might be awarded from them. The question is, um, in practice, what is the real um, size of those sorts of risks? What sort of compensation are you looking for, looking at for, for unfair dismissals? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you want to know how many dismissals have been made, first of all, I think. Um, you want to know whether these are collective um, redundancies, which can increase um, possible risks, because if there's protective awards, a protective award for failure to collectively consult, that's 90 days gross pay 
um, for all the affected employees. So that's something to remember as well. Um, but under the individual unfair dismissal liability, it's currently capped, compensation is currently capped at um, £88,519 or a maximum of 12 months pay, um, whichever is lower. Um, but in reality, um, you're probably going to be trying to gauge an average award, which comes out usually around uh, sort of £10,000. But it's important to remember the employees do have to mitigate their loss. So um, I mentioned earlier the job situation in, a, in any specific area. If it's going to be quite easy for the employees to get alternative employment, that risk of unfair dismissal is going to be lower because they'll be able to mitigate their losses a lot quicker um, and um, by getting alternative employment. Um, I think it's also useful to know here, and I did mention um, earlier, whether the, the workforce is, is unionised. Um, because if there are trade unions involved, then quite often you're more likely to, um, to be on the receiving end of a claim. And once you've got one, you, you've, got, you've got all of them. Uh, I mean, in one case that I dealt with for a client, um, there weren't unions, but the, um, the employees all had a, a very large history of social media um, interaction. And they'd had situations before where the employee groups had... Um, had talked amongst themselves using social media, I think it was Facebook. And so if you've got a situation there, that's also going to increase the risk of multiple claims. Yeah, everybody's very connected. Um, so um, there's one other question. Well, there's, well there's, a, there's a few actually, but one um, which I think it makes sense to pick up because it's probably going to be very relevant to, to lots of people. You were very clear that it's very difficult um, as a buyer to get indemnities from an administrator. It mm -hmm. tends to be one way traffic in a fairly um, frantic uh, mm -hmm. and uh, urgent situation. If you are going to try to get some indemnities from an administrator, have you got any tips for buyers as to what they should ask for and how they should frame those requests to stand the best chance of getting them? I think that's the nub of the question. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to, um, to, to just remember that the administrators aren't ever going to give any protections out um, and the seller is insolvent, so they haven't got anything to give. Um, you'd be making a claim against um, in the insolvency, so you're, you're going to be right at the bottom of the pile in terms of recovery. Um, but I think that the problem that buyers often face is that the administrators try and place more liability on the buyer than they might um, otherwise inherit under cheapy and that's done under the sale agreement um, so the administrators want that want the buyer to give them effectively a clean slate they want them to pick up um, all potential liabilities and it's often really difficult um, to get the administrators to move from that um, they, they've got a duty for the you know to help their creditors and so they're really going to be pushing for it um, but here it is a commercial negotiation so where you get to usually is going to depend on bargaining strength. If you're the only buyer on the horizon and you know that the administrators really want to make that sale, then you're in a much better place than if there are uh, lots of bidders champing away trying to um, trying to buy the business at a bargain price. Um, but I mean, it may also be um, be important to consider other parts of the agreement, not just the employee section. There may be other more important considerations you need to focus on, but um, if you are in a commercial bargaining position, which, um, which permits you to push back on the administrators, definitely try and limit the scope of the indemnities that it's asking you to provide. So you want to make sure that there's a defined list of employees who are transferring. It doesn't in itself prevent other people from coming out the woodwork, making a claim under Chupi, claiming to transfer. But this is usually the, um, the scope under which the indemnities are framed. So this is the, the list of employees um, that you're going to be giving indemnity protection for. Um, so that moves on then that if you are giving um, indemnities, it only relates to that list. You don't give indemnities to the seller um, or the administrator for any employees who've already been dismissed, for example. They may be trying to get you to cover off any unfair dismissal claims or, or anything that, that might be brought. Um, you also want to try not to give an indemnity for the National Insurance Fund liabilities. So as a quick reminder, under Chupi, these are the limited um, wage arrears and holiday pay um, and some pension amounts that don't transfer to the buyer. 
and that's purely just because of the insolvency relaxation under Tupi. So the government pays those out and then the government comes after the um, insolvent company for that debt. So if you can um, leave the position as you have inherited under Tupi, that sometimes is the best place that you can get to as a buyer.